Good morning and welcome to the EduSat Network. Our topic of discussion today is interpersonal communication. Friends, we have already talked about intrapersonal communication in our previous lecture and today uh, as I already introduced the topic that shall be taken up our subject expert who is present with us in the studio. It is our privilege to introduce her. Uh, a communication expert, Dr. Surbhi Daya is uh, Associate Professor, Department of English Journalism, Indian Institute of Mass Communication, New Delhi. She has a total experience of 15 years which includes her industry as well as uh, experience in academia. Uh, Dr. Daya holds a PhD in mass communication and her specialization includes communication theory and uh, media management. And uh, with this brief introduction, I would like to welcome ma'am and request her to begin our today's lecture. Thank you. So, uh, continuing from the previous lecture wherein uh, we talked about intrapersonal communication. Today, I would like to focus this lecture just on interpersonal communication. So, interpersonal communication basically is, uh, you know, you know, we all have had moments, you know, when we have felt the need to reach out to others and to share our feelings and ideas. So, this sharing of experience with others is known as interpersonal communication. So, it is basically a communication which happens between two people wherein they share their experiences, their feelings, their emotions, their day to day activities, everything. Anthony Robbins once said, <clears throat> to effectively communicate, we must realize that we are all different in the way we perceive the world and use this understanding as a guide to our communication with others. So very true. The contextual view of interpersonal communication says that interpersonal communication differs from other forms of communication in terms of number of participants involved. The interactants are in close physical proximity to each other. There are many sensory channels used and feedback is immediate. An important point to note about the contextual definition is that it does not take into account the relationship between the interactants. Interpersonal communication is the process that helps us express our feelings, ideas, thoughts and share them with the people around us. It basically encompasses speech, non-verbal communication, unconscious communication and paraphrasing. It is a face to face communication between two people. Basically, it is the extension of ourselves to other people and their, their extension towards us. This type of communication basically includes most of the informal everyday exchanges that we engage in. One, both parties are in close proximity or two, both parties send and receive messages and three, these messages included both verbal and non-verbal stimuli. For example, we always rely to a friend's facial expressions, eye movements, hand gestures as well as others which he or she transmits. An interactional process between two people which is called as a dyad either could be face to face as I have just mentioned or it could also be a mediated uh, communication, it could take a mediated form. So, the unit of analysis if you see for interpersonal communication is the dyad or the relationship itself. Interpersonal perspectives, there are four specific perspectives from which to study interpersonal communication. Um, the first one is the relational or you can say the qualitative perspective. In, in this, the communication in which the roles of sender and receivers are shared by two people simultaneously in order to create meaning or in order to create a common uh, ground of understanding. The second, uh, the second perspective could be the situational perspective which is also called as the contextual perspective. 
So, communication that occurs between two people in a specific context is called as the contextual uh, communication. The third is the quantitative. Dietic interactions including impersonal communication is quantitative uh, communication and the functional or the strategic uh, aspect or perspective of communication interpersonal communication is that communication for the purpose of achieving interpersonal communication or interpersonal goals is uh, is termed as functional or strategic communication. So, these are the four different perspectives that you can analyze interpersonal communication in. Other features of interpersonal communication include uh, that it could you know occur in any environment, it could be formal, it could be informal. Most interpersonal messages are informal stemming from everyday face to face encounters from your first good morning to your last see you tomorrow, your interpersonal communication is usually spontaneous, unplanned and loosely organized, probably even ungrammatical sometimes. So, these uh, two types of uh, interpersonal communication I will just discuss with you one is direct interpersonal communication and the other one is the mediated interpersonal communication. So, let us see what is the basic difference between the two. Direct interpersonal communication involves a direct face to face relationship between the sender and the receiver of the message who are in an independent relationship. Now, because of the interpersonal communications immediacy uh, that is it is taking place now and the primacy that is it is taking place here, it is characterized by a strong feedback component. Communication is enhanced when the relationship exists over a long period of time. Interpersonal communication involves not only the words used, but also the various elements of nonverbal communication. The purpose of interpersonal communications are, are many are, are to influence basically. Now, the mediated interpersonal communication involves technology that assists or links the sender and the receiver of the messages. This may involve immediacy, live or the so called real time. It does not involve a primary context, but instead uses a technologically, you know, technology to link uh, the various parties in communication. Mediated communication offers the advantage that it allows people to communicate over a distance or throughout a time span that would not be possible in direct communication. For example, emails offer instantaneous global communication and cell phones are highly mobile. Computer technology makes it possible for people to do their jobs without being physically present, allowing them to work for their home or from their home or from across the world. Like direct communication, mediated communication may be formal or informal, personal or public. Feedback may immediate, may be immediate or may be delayed. Machines even can assist in communication across language barriers. Mediated communication has uh, several inherent limitations including the ability of telephone or uh, internet users to mask or disguise the source of the message or the susceptibility of machines to various mechanical or technological noise sources. Now, let us talk about the various types of interpersonal communication, the diode that I was just referring to. So, the dietic communication is simply a method of communication that only involves two people such as a telephone conversation or even a set of letters sent to and received from a pen pal or a friend. The process involves the four basic elements, the sender, the receiver, the message and the feedback. 
dyadic versus small group communication if you talk about much interpersonal communication involves a dyad or two people in close contact as a result the potential for sending receiving and evaluating messages is divided between the two halves of the dyad that is both participants alternate from one role to the other sometimes originating messages at other times responding to them now both roles provide a means for exchanging information but neither is complete in itself if one participant listened or and the other participant only spoke so communication would soon break down thus communication in a dyad is a very much shared responsibility where the sender and the receiver should be equally participating in the dyadic communication that they are into you can see the diagram there's a person a there's a person b and the uh, it's a sort of a venn diagram where there is a sharing of the common uh, ground of understanding as well now the interpersonal dyads if you talk about they focus on the sharing of meaning as shown in the previous uh, diagram so you can just see the diagram again and then it is it, it basically focuses on the sharing of meaning now although interpersonal dyads may also solve problems or make decisions their messages convey a wider range of feelings and emotions the process of translating thoughts into verbal and non-verbal messages increases the communicator's awareness of his or her feelings and self-concept in turn the listener's responses confirm or alter these feelings with effective interpersonal communication this process becomes reciprocal both participants strengthen themselves and each other through the sharing of meanings and emotions if you think otherwise just think of an example of the person you wish to interact with the most why is it so because you you trust the person you might have control on the person you have faith on the person and therefore you share the most of the secrets with him or her and because of that the common ground of understanding increases and the sharing of meaning and emotions provide a further common ground of understanding of the messages now if you if we talk about some related concepts in interpersonal communication these are some terms that we use normally every day like conversation conversation is often considered informal and everyday speech but more formally a finite element within an ongoing relationship based on interpersonal communication so most conversations of a standard five step process of opening up building up substance feedback and closing so most conversations follow this pattern of opening and uh, you know building up the uh, talk and substance and then taking a feedback and maybe closing that conversation since a conversation is a two way process it involves various controls so many associated with conversational tones the changing of the speaker etc and listener's role so conversation can exist in both direct as well as mechanical settings the next term that we can talk about is a uh, speech uh, speech act an intentional utterance made to achieve an intended goal in an informal context a speech act might be a promise made by a parent to his or her child a more formal example of a speech act is an interview given by a government leader with hopes of persuading voters so we've just seen the example uh, the historic win of um, kejriwal it is just the you know result of the persuading and influence and 
the interpersonal communication and the promises that he has made to the uh, people of Delhi. Communication competence is another term we can talk about. The ability to communicate in a socially acceptable way is called as communication competence. For interpersonal relations, this involves the speaker's interactions with others. For more public situations, uh, this involves the audience perception of the speaker in terms of vocal presentation, message control, command of language, physical appearances and so on. The list is long. <clears throat> Another term that we uh, can talk about is a self-disclosure. Now, the process of making internal revelations about oneself that others would be unlikely to know otherwise. While self-disclosure is an individual communication tactic, it invites reciprocity. So, gender differences, if you talk about communication scholars have researched the varying ways men and women communicate, which often varies further among different cultures and countries. Some of the major differences um, are that men use report talk to share information or demonstrate knowledge, whereas women often use report talk to uh, enhance relationships and share experiences. Another important term that we can discuss is meta communication. So, communication about the act or process of communication rather than focusing on the content of communication is called as meta communication. I repeat that a communication about the act or the process of communication rather than focusing on the content of communication is called as meta communication. For example, a couple that argues about how to spend their money is communicating. A couple that discusses how to, how they argue is engaging in meta communication. The next topic that I would like to discuss is stereotypes, because stereotypes hold a very important place uh, in interpersonal communications. How we communicate with other is, others is sometimes a result of the stereotypes that we make in our own mind about others and that is why we, we, we talk differently to different people, uh, uh, you know, which is, uh, which is uh, different for most of the people rather. So, a natural result of communication is the development of stereotypes. When we talk to somebody, we develop stereotype for him or her, which are attitudes or judgments we make about people based not on personal experience, but rather on what we have learned about them through communication. American journalist Walter Lippmann once said, he called these stereotypes as the pictures in the head. So, the pictures in the head are basically the stereotypes that we make of other people after talking to them, after interacting with them and we make the first impressions and those impressions con convert uh, themselves into stereotypes. And though through stereotypes, we categorize people, we presume to understand their characteristics and thus make sense of uh, a complex world. Thus, they can enhance communication and relationships. So, stereotypes which can be positive um, or negative usually are associated with, with our attitudes about people and ideas, both our own and uh, those of others. So, it, it, it is actually very, very important to study what stereotypes are and how we form stereotypes and what is the result or the consequence of framing a stereotype on interpersonal communications as a whole.
communication researchers have identified three basic principles about stereotypes. First is that the stereotype contains ambivalent beliefs about relationship between groups. They heighten perceptions of negative and extreme behavior. They maintain divisions between in groups that is us and out groups that's, that is them. So, uh, there is a difference between uh, the uh, us and the them groups. So, that is all based on the stereotypes we hold for other people. The problem with stereotypes is that particularly when they, neg when they negatively pre pre prejudge others, uh, they make it very difficult to correctly interpret information we see and hear. So, because of the preconceived notions that we have in our mind, we either talk to a person or we do not talk to a person or we uh, have some reservations talking everything about uh, you know to that person. So, <clears throat> negativity uh, or negatively judging somebody or having a preconceived notion about uh, somebody may you know create a problem in the conversation that we otherwise would have with that person. So, rather than accepting information at a uh, face value and inter interpreting the other in the in a favorable or neutral light, negative stereotypes lead us to presume the worst in others. This is an example of communication breakdown, a phenomenon in which normal process of communication is thawed because inappropriate and erroneous interruptions are given to incoming information. We use these stereotypes every day to make judgments about people. For example, in personal or in family and social context, stereotypes play a role in parents' decisions about their children's playmates. Or in commercial settings, you can say that stereotypes affect both who business uh, in the world with and how they structure business. So, it all depends on how uh, what sort of stereotypes they hold for others. So, now uh, we move on to uh, the theories of interpersonal communication because the target audience for this lecture is uh, the communication students. So, basically if uh, theoretically, you should be knowing what are the basic theories which pertain to interpersonal communication. So, if we talk about the basic things, then uh, interpersonal communication has uh, the functional theories, has a relational communication theories. The functional theories addresses the functions of interpersonal communication and the relational communication theories focuses on the dim dimensions of interpersonal relationships. Theory of a coordinated management of meaning is also important which addresses the meanings in interpersonal relationships and the rules through which we construct interpersonal communication. So, what are those rules? How do we reach to a uh, a coordinated message and we find our meaning in the message. So, let us, uh, let us study some important uh, theories of interpersonal communication. So, just go through the list of the representative theories. Uh, the first one is communication pragmatics, <coughs> which is also called as interactional view. This was given by Watzlawick. The second uh, theory is the competence theory, which was given by Spitzberg and Kupa. Then constructivism is another theory, which was given by Delia. Coordinated management of meaning was given by Peirce and Cronan. Expen expectancy violation, Burgoon. Fundamental interpersonal relations, orientation, cuts and interpersonal deception was given by Buller and Burgoon again. Marital communication Fitzpatrick and relational dialectics was given by Baxter and Montgomery. Social exchange theory was given by Thibel and Calais. Then there are three more theories which you can call as social penetration which was given by Altman and Taylor. 
you can refer to the stages of relationship development which is the most important theory uh, um, amongst uh, all these theories because it makes you understand the stages and the phases of how a relationship develops and uh, what are the stages of the relationship development and then uh, what are the phases of relationship disintegration when it comes to an end how does it come to an end why don't we s speak to the other person or why do we stop speaking to the other person uh, whom we were you know s speaking the most maybe few days back and then we have the uncertainty reduction theory which was given by Berger and Calabrese so let us uh, try and understand some of these theories in detail because that they will then define how all the five W's and one edge of communication that what happens, how it happens, where it happens, with whom it happens. So things like this. So let us start with the first theory which is the communication pragmatics and interactional view. Uh, so, uh, relationships within a family system are interconnected and highly resistant to change. Uh, communications among members has both a content and relationship component. The system can be transformed only when members receive outside help to reframe the relational punctuation. Individual interpretations are uh, inter in interactional view is also known as the theory of pragmatics because of the dependence of the particular situation at hand. So miscommunication occurs because people are not speaking the same language. These languages contrast because people have different points of views from which they are speaking. When people's content and relationship component do not match up, miscommunication is likely to occur. So let us have a look at the meta theoretical assumptions of this theory, uh, which uh, while this theory uses axioms, it, it seems that the theory is more humanistic. The axioms provide a framework for how communication takes place, but these axioms are only a framework. The theory is also dependent upon the situation in order to explain what is really taking place. Each situation is unique every time you have a different situation you know so there are multiple truths and ontologically the theory leans towards more uh, free will you know while the axioms are a framework in a situation people can choose to communicate in certain ways. And axio axiologically the theory is value laden since it is so dependent on independent in interpretations. The critique of this theory is that many of the critiques of this theory uh, are actually based on upon scientific criteria but since the theory is more humanistic in nature so the humanistic criteria will be applied here. The theory does seem to have analytical consistency and heuristic views values its methodological rigor is questionable since applying it to individual situations can make approaching this theory systematically difficult while the theory seems practical its application can be somewhat difficult there have been many questions surrounding the axioms on which the theory is loosely based these criticisms are not of great value since the actual axioms are supports for the theory but not the sole basis. So if you talk about the implication of this theory, this theory has many implications for everyday life since uh, families often uh, suffer from miscommunication. This theory is able to explain why such things takes, take place. The theory suggestion to reframe problems in order to gain a better understanding of what is going on seems like sound and practical advice. Uh, we can have an example here where a man and his wife are having a difficult time talking to one uh, another about issues surrounding their child. 
So, the wife believes that the problems are the result of not having both parents around enough at home. But the father feels that the problems are a normal part of adolescence and the child will grow up or grow out of it. In fact, the, the child is suffering because of tremendous pressure to succeed at school. The pressure is coming from the child's teacher in this case, not from the parents. So, the author of the theory, uh, uh, the theorist uh, says that it, he, he, he actually suggests that a discussion should happen that would involve the child and both parents would prove beneficial uh, because it would allow the parents to reframe their misinformed position and take action that would redress the, uh, that would address the true problem. The parents could then uh, speak with the teacher probably and reassure their child that he or she should try to perform their best without feeling pressure from uh, others. So, the next theory is uh, called as the communication competence. Communication competence uh, if you talk about is um, the ability to choose a communication behavior that is most appropriate and effective for a given situation. So, interpersonal competency allows one to achieve their communication goals without causing the other party to lose face. The model most often used to describe competence is the component model which includes three components. One is knowledge, the other one is skill and the other one is motivation. Knowledge simply means uh, knowing what behavior is best suited for a given situation. Skill is having the ability to apply that behavior in the given, in the given context. So, motivation is having the desire to communicate in a competent manner basically and uh, the model's three parts requires that a communicator be able to recognize what communication practice is appropriate that is knowledge uh, to have the ability to perform that practice that is skill and want to communicate in an effective and appropriate manner that is motivation but uh, most of the theories have their own critiques. So, this one says that uh, the component model of competence is not a theory about communication, but rather a model that sets the framework for what makes someone a component communi competent communicator. The competent, uh, the component model here has been uh, used as the basis for many other models of competence because of its branches. The model can be easily applied to the criteria of effectiveness and appropriateness that make up a competent uh, communicator. The implications are uh, specifically there is a new focus on this idea of competence that is concerned with how the diet creates competency rather than the focus on the individual competency. So, in this model a diet's communication can be competent in that within the relationship it is both effective and appropriate, but to those outside of the group it might seem, in, seem in, incompetent. So, in order to be a competent communicator, one must be able to recognize which skills are necessary in a particular situation, have those skills and be properly motivated to use those skills. The other theory, the third theory that we are discussing today is about constructivism. Constructivism uh, is another theory which says that people who are cognitively complex in their perceptions of others have a greater capacity for sophisticated communication that will achieve positive outcomes. They are, they can employ a rhetorical message design logic that creates person centered message that, stim that simultaneously pursues multiple communication goals. 
so the individual interpretation of this theory could be that as a theory it is concerned with the cognitive processes that precede the actual communicating or communication uh, within a given situation. Measuring and observing these cognitive processes can be a difficult task. While I agree that people who are able to adapt their messages to a particular situation and audiences are more successful than those who are, who are not able to do so. Saying that those who are more cognitively complex are always more successful in probably misrepresenting the truth. The meta theoretical assumptions for uh, this theory could be that epistemologically constructivism allows for multiple truths depending on both the abilities of the communicator and receiver in creating and understanding cognitively complex messages. Ontologically, some people have the ability to act using a rhetorical design logic. Uh, while others are forced to react through the use of either expressive or conventional design logic. Axiologically, this theory is value conscious because while it recognizes the capacity for value influence, it does not subscribe to any particular patterns. The critique says that it is a scientific theory that is that attempts to explain why some people are more successful in attaining their interpersonal communication goals than others. It also makes predictions that people who are more cognitively complex will be more successful because of the, their ability to use rhetorical design logic in sending their messages. And attempting to study cognitive processes is a difficult task and uh, can make a situation quite complicated. Therefore, the application of this theory is not very simple. The next important theory is uh, the coordinated management of meaning. It means that this theory is assuming that two individuals engaging in an interaction are each constructing their own interpretations and perceptions behind what a conversation means. A core assumption within this theory includes the belief that all individuals interact based on rules that are expected to be followed while engaging in communication. Individuals within any social situation first want to understand what is going on and apply rules to figure things out. There are two different types of rules that individuals can apply in an, any communicative situation. These include constructive and, regu and regulative rules. Basically, constructive rules are essentially rules of meaning used by communicators to interpret or understand an event or message. Regulative rules are essentially rules of action used to determine how to respond or behave. An example of this uh, could be seen in if one thinks of, an, of a hypothetical situation in which two individuals are engaging in conversation. If one individual sends a message to the other, the message receiver must then take the interaction and interpret what it means. Often this can be done on an almost instantaneous level because the interpretation rules applied to the situation are immediate and quite simple. Now this CMM, uh, it is a meaning centered theory of communication or its primary focus lies on how we coordinate and manage meaning in our everyday life. As per Pierce and Cronin, the developers of this theory, two specific sets of rules which we have just talked about, constructive and regulative rules are govern this theory. Just see uh, the slide carefully. If you see in the initial meeting, somebody smiles. Uh, so that's considered as a sign of friendliness. As shown, the arrow indicates what the given behavior should count as and the symbol bracket indicate the situation 
or the context. Regulatory, regulative rules on the other hand tell you how we should behave in a certain situation. Continuing with the same example given below or uh, sorry above, uh, we can apply regulative rules in the following way. Initial interaction, the other person smiles, I should also smile in return or the this symbol denotes if you if you respond with x, I will respond with y. The authors of this theory believe that there are a number of different contexts an individual can refer to while interpreting a communicative event. These include the relationship context, the episode context, the self concept uh, context and the archetype context. The meta theoretical assumptions say it views social world as plural says that depending on specific situations and context, the meaning created and understood can be varying. The next theory is the expectancy violation theory which sees communication as the exchange of information which is high in relational content and can be used to violate the expectations of another which will be perceived as either positive or negative depending on the liking between the two people. So, when our expectations are violated we will respond in specific ways. If an act is unexpected and is assigned favorable interpretation and it is evaluated positively it will produce more favorable outcomes than an expected act with the same interpretation and evaluation. Um, an example could be an applicable example here could be to help understand this theory. When uh, a person called Sham goes for a job interview, he feels that he is not getting very positive feedback from the potential employer. So, he knows he should not violate expectancies and further hurt his chances of impressing the interviewer. So, howsoever Sham suddenly felt more confident about the relationship he was building with the interviewer, he might co consciously violate his or her expectations. He could pick up a picture on his or her desk and comment positively on the picture hoping that this act would make him positively stick out in the employer's mind later. Another theory that is important here is the interpersonal deception. So, communication senders attempt to manipulate messages so as to be untruthful which may cause them apprehension concerning their false communication being detected. So, simultaneously communication receives receivers try to unveil or detect the validity of that information causing suspicion about whether or not the sender is being deceitful. There are three aspects of deceptive messages. First, the central deceptive message which is usually verbal, ancillary message which includes both verbal and non-verbal aspects of communication that often reveals the truthfulness of a particular message and inadvertent behaviors which are mostly nonverbal and help to point out the deceit of the sender through a term called leakage. Then there is marital communication which is quite understandable by the name itself. By measuring three major factors this theory suggests that married couples tend to cluster into three distinct groups along uh, these dimensions, the traditionals, the independents and the separates. Then there is something called as relational dialectics, uh, communication parties experience internal conflicting pulls causing relationships to be in a constant state of flux no, known as dialectical tension. The pressures of these tensions occur in a wave like or cyclic fashion over time. Relational dialectics include the concept that our closer individuals becomes become to one another, the more conflict will arise to pull them apart. 
relational partners uh, need predictability along with a sense of assurance in their interpersonal relationships and uh, in an interpersonal relationship communication partners feel the pressure to be transparent and reveal extensive personal information. However, this pull counters a natural individual desire for privacy. This dynamic struggle demonstrates that intimacy in relationships is not a straight line path. So, if you see the assumptions as well, in this sense theory is extremely humanistic. Relational dialectics believe that there are many truths depend, dependent on the individual nature of each relationship. The theory is also quite humanistic in the relationship between the research being done and uh, the researchers why on this topic what is researched is dependent on the observer. So, I, uh, I really feel that relational dialectics is humanistic in value sense as well as, uh, as well. Uh, research being done is value laden and based because each dialectic is an opinion which must be made by the individual researcher. So, the next uh, theory that I wish to discuss is the social penetration theory. The social penetration theory states that uh, as relationships develop, communication moves from relatively shallow and um, you know nominate levels to deeper, more personal ones. The next theory uh, which I wish to discuss here is uncertainty reduction theory which says that initial interactions between strangers are categorized by inform information seeking in order to reduce uncertainty. So, uncertainty is reduced as levels of self disclosure, non verbal warmth and similarity increases. Uh, the truth set forth by this theory is that people attempt to make sense of interpersonal situations by reducing uncertainty through seeking information. Now, if we talk about the functions of interpersonal communication, uh, you know the functional theory of interpersonal communication, we use interpersonal communication for a variety of reasons. Uh, they serve precisely three functions, uh, one is that it serves as a linking function between a person and his or her environment. It allows us to conceptualize, to remember a, a plan. Each part of the mentation function serves to regulate our own and others behavior which is called regulating function. One reason we engage in interpersonal communication is that we gain knowledge about other individuals and social penetration theory says that we attempt to gain information about others so that we can interact with them more effectively. We can better predict how they will think, feel and act if we know who they are. We gain this information passively by observing them, actively by having others engage them or interactively by engaging them ourselves. So, the self disclosure is often used to get information from the other person. Interpersonal communication is important because of all the functions it achieves. Whenever we engage in communication with another person, we seek to gain information about them and uh, we also engage in interpersonal communication to help us better understand what someone says in a given context. The words we say can mean very different things depending on how they are said or in what context they are said. Content messages refer to the surface level meaning of the message. So, relationship messages refer to how a message is said, the two are sent simultaneously, but each affects the meaning assigned to the communication. Another reason we engage 
in interpersonal communication is to establish an identity. We have our interpersonal needs. Uh, the three identified needs are inclusion, control, affection. Then there is a relational communication theory which we discussed in the beginning and uh, the three dimensions which are most important are the control, trust and intimacy dimensions of relationship. There are some factors which are affecting the interpersonal relations. So, based on the past experiences people make assumptions about the nature of the other person and of the particular kind of situation they are in. So, each person develops positive or negative feelings then these perceptions contribute to, to evaluation of the other person and we talked about stereotypes at length. So, there could be personality features, the self concept features, the misperception, the selective interaction, selective evaluation, response evocation etcetera. Then there could be a personal frame of reference which uh, the two individuals could get into and there are certain things which could you know uh, there is a def defensiveness about it. Defense is the cognitive distortion that projects the self concept against being diminished. So, these are some of the common defense mechanisms that we I have listed here could be rationalization or repression or projection or regression etcetera. And then interpersonal relational needs are there which we have already discussed about and of course, the most important is the feelings. So, interpersonal communication, the process of interpersonal communication cannot be regarded as just a phenomena which simply happens, but should be seen as a process which involves participants negotiating their role in this process whether consciously or unconsciously. So, this is a psychological context to it, there is a relational, situational, environmental, cultural, developmental context to everything that we are talking about to others and there could be channels like oral communication could be there, written could be there, visual could be there, it could be a public speaking, small group communication, other levels of communication that we will be talking about in the uh, subsequent lectures. If you talk about the styles of interpersonal communication, the major styles, the different styles are the controlling style, the egalitarian style, the structuring style, the dynamic style relinquishing style and the withdrawal style. So, these are the various styles of uh, interpersonal communication that one can talk about and of course, the Johari's window which we talked about in the in while I was discussing intrapersonal communication having four quadrants. So, I am not repeating it again, but uh, how one opens up and how much one opens up, how he what are the di uh, four different quadrants of the window. So, the last part of it I am just concluding my lecture with the different phases of the relationship development and disintegration. So, the five phases in which the develop which the relationship develops is initiation that is the first stage of relationship development where we make conscious and unconscious judgments about others and then we start experimenting you know after making this initial contact we begin to experiment when, when this stage is known as the do you know period of interaction and then the relationship starts intensifying where you know we develop friendships and participation and awareness they are uh, in, uh, intensified and then the stage uh, goes on to integrating stage where we start meeting the expectations of the other person and then the final bonding you know starts where wherein it, it, it becomes a powerful force in which the relationship betters or worsens and we make commitments and sacrifices and uh, in case of conflict, in case of conflict we can you know how this relationship can uh, uh, disintegrate various uh, at various stages. So, Knapp has outlined a similar reverse pattern for the same. So, the differentiation starts occurring then uh, uh, communication likewise plays a central role here and uh, the it, it comes to stagnation and then overtness avoiding others and then the termination is the final stage of breakdown of this interpersonal relationship. Uh, uh, with this I would like to end my uh, uh, interaction with you uh, you know coming back with uh, the next levels of communication in the subsequent lectures. 
uh, thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for this very interesting and uh, very clear lucidly uh, presented lecture for us that our students would greatly benefit from this and uh, as ma'am has already talked about she shall be back with uh, more things to talk about more uh, very uh, wonderfully created lecture so friends uh, we must thank ma'am for being present and uh, being associated with us thank you so much ma'am for coming and thank you friends for watching have a great day Thank you.